Hello, my name is James Broom. I'm the Director of Engineering at a UK-based technology consultancy called Engine. We're Microsoft Core Partners for Cloud, for Data Platform, for Data Analytics, for DevOps and for Power BI. Um, so we do lots of work for our customers um, around data analytics in Azure. Uh, and that's meant over the past couple of years doing lots of work in Azure Synapse. And today I'm going to talk for the next 10 minutes or so around two things very close to my heart. Uh, one is notebooks, specifically Synapse notebooks, but everything I'm going to talk about is applicable to other notebook technologies, for example, Databricks or Jupyter notebooks or other kind of notebook technologies you might have used and testing. And I'm going to explain why testing is important in relation to notebooks as we go through the talk. Um, you can see from the big clock behind me, this is a pre-recorded talk. Um, I've only got 10 minutes. Um, the reason I wanted to pre-record it is because I'm going to be doing things with Spark and Spark is an instant in terms of running queries and I don't want to waste nine of those 10 minutes waiting for Spark sessions to load and queries to run. So there might be points where I kind of skip, um, uh, fast forward the video um, a little bit to, to save some time, but I'm going to try and keep it as real time and as live as possible as we go through. I'm going to switch straight over to Synapse Studio and get stuck straight in. So let's imagine that we're working for an organization that sells things. Um, in the data lake, we've got an extract from our source system called orders CSV. Um, if we look at that, it's a fairly simple schema. We've got an order ID, a date, a region, city, category, product, quantity, price, and total price. So basically, what did we sell, how much of, and where did we sell it? And let's imagine that the business has said, okay, our, our source system doesn't give us any reporting requirements uh, um, and we really want to start calculating things like how much do we sell uh, per region, right? So let's start as that as a kind of an initial use case. And we know our, our data is now data lake, so we think, okay, a good place to start would be to use notebooks to start exploring the data, look at the shape of it, maybe do some data prep and cleansing, and then start to calculate these reporting metrics that the business wants. So we create a notebook, looks something like this. Um, we're going to load the data in from the lake, pointing to our CSV file into a data frame. We discover that there's some duplicated data uh, from the source system, so we're going to drop duplicates where we've got duplicate order IDs, um, at which point we can then calculate our sales by region by selecting the region and total price columns, grouping by region, summing total price and doing a quick column rename, and then writing the results back out to the data lake. If we run this notebook, um, you'll see it executes fairly quickly because the session is already started up. Um, and um, when this is finished running, we're actually going to see the output in the final cell here. And if we go back in the data lake, we'll see the output written back to the data lake as well. So here we go, uh, east and west region and total sales. Go back into here, go into output. You'll see we have a CSV file that looks a bit like the output we just saw. There we go. So very simple use case. Um, and obviously in real life, this would probably be a lot more complicated, but the point is we've defined an ETL process in a notebook. And one of the most powerful things I think about Synapse notebooks is that it's very easy to go from this ad hoc, experimental, um, kind of exploratory uh, kind of process that notebooks are really powerful and, uh, and good for, to be able to just go add to pipeline, a uh, new pipeline, and suddenly our notebook can now be a repeatable automated process that the business would rely on. This could run overnight if we had a trigger, it could run whenever new data lands in the lake and suddenly we've gone from you know kind of exploration ad hoc to line of business and the business now can depend on these insights because they're, they're they're running all the time and that's amazing but it does present some challenges and that challenge is um we've very quickly gone from um exploring an idea to producing something that the business is now gonna gonna use to make decisions on so we want it in and bake in quality how do we know that the results we've just produced are correct for example how do we know we've dropped um, the duplicates, how do we know that that's working correctly, that we haven't you know, taken too much data out or that we've you know, targeted the ones we do consider duplicates? How do we know that we've aggregated the data correctly to create our total sales by region? So really what we're saying is the flexibility and kind of power of note notebooks is brilliant, but the downside is often it kind of builds the habit to start to feel like it's justified to ignore a lot of actual kind of very sensible engineering practices. And what I'm going to show you is uh, how you can actually just with very few kind of mindset changes, a bit of restructuring, a bit of refactoring, start to introduce testing to the notebook process. So you get the best of both worlds. You get a notebook to go to, to, to kind of get going with really, really quickly. And then you start to add tests in to build in uh, probably like regression um, quality gates, if you like, so we don't um, uh, we don't kind of lose quality over time. And also make sure the logic we add into that notebook is, is, is correct. So let's move away from this notebook. and into our second one. And the first thing we're going to do is restructure the logic we had in the notebook into a series of functions. So typically notebook is going to be used for some kind of data prep. 
probably some kind of ETL process. And that's quite nice because you've generally got a series of steps anyway. So if we break that down, we did something that loaded data, we removed our duplicates, we calculated our cells by region, and we saved the output. So each of those steps, I've now split out into a separate cell. I've been explicit that this is a piece of, a piece of functionality, a, a unit of, of, of code that we want to test. And I've been explicit about what that thing is going to do by defining it as a function and calling it something that describes the intent of that piece of logic. So load the data, remove duplicate orders, takes in a data frame, drops the duplicates and returns it back out again. Calculate cells by region, takes a data frame, does what it needs to do, sends it back out again. Now, if we were to run this notebook, once we've defined all the cells as, as, as functions, something interesting would happen. We'd actually not get any results. And the reason for that is the notebook runs, and all it's doing is, is actually defining the functions. In order to actually execute the functions the same way as we did previously, we need to add another cell at the bottom that's actually going to act as our kind of an orchestration cell, if you like. We need something that's going to control the flow of execution, that's actually going to call all those functions we've just defined to produce the same results. And if we were to run this, it would load the data, remove the duplicate orders, calculate the cells by region and save the output and we'll end up with the same results. And that's brilliant because now we've got the same behavior with a simple kind of change, but we've structured the notebook in a way that we can now test it. Okay, so in this version of the notebook, we've started to add some tests. And uh, if you've done any work with Python before, this is a PySpark uh, back notebook, then it's just like writing Python unit tests. Uh, PyTest, for example, is one of the imported packages in a Snaps workspace. So you can work with it straight away by importing it into your notebook. And then it's about, well, what actually are we testing? Well, we've got uh, a function called remove duplicate orders. So that would be a good place to start. Let's make sure that behaves as we expect. So we can add another cell. Again, we're defining this as a function. And that says we want to test that orders with the duplicated order ID are removed. And we're being explicit about what we're testing. We can manually create Spark data frames in line to simulate our test data scenarios. In this case, two rows of data. All the fields are, the, sorry, uh, the order IDs are the same uh, and the fields are kind of slightly different. When we run our remove duplicate orders uh, function over the data frame, we want to make sure that one of them is removed uh, because there are uh, there are two with the same order ID, and we expect one to be returned. And if, uh, if it does not like that, then we're going to have a customer message explaining what's going on. So it's a simple arrange act to cert kind of unit test pattern uh, using built-in uh, Python testing frameworks on the Snaps workspace, and using the ability to kind of create Spark data frames in memory in order to to, to test it. So that's a simple unit test. Um, what you tend to find in testing is you kind of test one scenario and it immediately makes you think, well, what about something else? So if you want to make sure that duplicated order IDs are removed, what about um, orders that look exactly the same but have different order IDs? So here we go. Here's a it logic leads me to build a kind of a different scenario, which is similar orders with a different ID are not removed. So we've got three rows of data here. All the fields are the same. The order IDs are different. Based on our current logic, we expect all of these rows to be returned. So we run this test and we expect three orders to come back. And if they don't, then something's gone wrong and we want to throw an error accordingly. Final unit test I've got in this notebook is around the regional sales calculations. Uh, so again, we can simulate some more test data. We've got three sales in the East region, one in the West. If we call our calculate sales by region, we expect what our, what our figure is going to be based on a manual calculation we can do, you know, based on this subset of data and check this as we expect. And if not, we're going to throw an error message. So we defined all these tests as functions like in the previous notebook which means we need to orchestrate running them. Uh, so down the bottom here, we've got our ETL process, but before we do that, we're gonna call all our tests. And if I run all that, you'll see that all the tests are currently passing because, um, because uh, our logic is correct. But equally, we can, I can show you what happens when my test fails. Okay, so the notebook has run and we've got our output as usual, and no errors. We go to our uh, function that defines uh, remove duplicate orders and we change the logic here. Okay, so let's comment this out and say it's not actually based on uh, just the order ID, but actually it's based on distinct. So every field has to be the same for us to consider it a duplicate. We run that again now, our logic has changed, which means our unit tests are going to fail because um, uh, the, the behavior behind that kind of piece of business logic is different. So when we run and we get down to uh, the final orchestration step, here we go, we've got an error. So in test orders with duplicate order IDs are removed test we expected one order, but two were returned. And that's because all the fields aren't the same, so we didn't consider them duplicates, and therefore the test that we expected to pass has now failed. So we can easily test our notebooks by restructuring them accordingly, uh, wrapping our business logic in functions, and adding unit test code into the notebook to, uh, to execute that logic and improve your behaviors as we expect. But 
As you can probably imagine, this might get quite unwieldy quite quickly. This is a very, very simple use case in this ETL process. But already our notebook's getting quite long. We've got test logic mixed interspersed with our, our you know, actual ETL logic. We've got a big orchestration thing down here that could get, you know, get longer and longer. So how do we kind of manage this going forward? How do we kind of restructure things a bit, a bit more to make this simpler uh, to, to work with um, as things get more complicated? So I'm going to show you two ways that we can do this. Um, both involve splitting out the test logic from the core kind of business process logic. And the first example, we're going to rely on something that's built into notebooks, uh, a little what they call a magic command, uh, the, the percent run command that allows us to reference one notebook from another. And by doing that, it's going to basically run the existing notebook or pull it into memory for life. So all the variables that are defined in the call notebook are available in the calling notebook. So with that in mind, we can split out our notebooks into a test notebook and a main kind of processing notebook. So in the test notebook, we are going to call into our processing notebook. And another thing we can do is take advantage of the parameters that are available in the notebooks to pass in the fact we want to run this in what I've called test mode. So we look at the processing notebook. We've set a variable called test mode and set it to false. We've marked this cell as a parameter cell, which means this is one of the parameters available to, to set. If we were to run the processing notebook on its own, test mode is false. It's going to run all the way through as before. And all I've done is saying, if not test mode, then run the workflow. So if we ran this notebook, it would run the end-to-end -end ETL process because we're not running tests. It's going to run the orchestration cell and everything's going to happen and our output's going to get written to the lake. If we ran the test notebook, however, it's slightly more interesting because we're going to run this notebook automatically. All those function definitions that we defined in that notebook are now available in the test notebook. So all our tests can run as normal. Because we pass test mode in, it's not actually going to run the orchestration cell at the end. No data is going to get written to the lake. We're not actually going to you know, do the processing. We're just going to define the functions, which means at the end, our tests have run successfully and nothing's been written. So, so that's a really easy way to split out test logic from your processing and use the parameter cells and the magic command uh, percent run to link the two together. And the second and final approach I'm going to show you, which is probably a better solution kind of long term, is to get more and more notebooks, more and more logic in those notebooks, is to actually split things out even further. So in this case, I've now got three notebooks. I've defined a sales data functions notebook, which literally just contains the definitions of functions that we're going to use in both our processing and our tests. So running this notebook, there's no orchestration cell. Running this notebook would just define the functions and make them available for use. As you can probably guess then, the notebook that actually runs the, or the orchestration now becomes a lot simpler. It also uses the magic command to run the functions notebook to define the functions. And now our orchestration cell is here, which ties the whole thing together. We load the data, remove the duplicate orders, calculate the cells by region, and save the output back to the data lake. And equally, our test notebook does a similar thing. It no longer needs to pass in the parameters, the, uh, the, the test mode parameter anymore. We just define the functions by calling the magic command run, and then we run our unit tests. What's great now, we've now got two entry points. We've got an entry point into the, the ETL process. We've got an entry point into the test. So now if we go back to thinking about adding this into a pipeline. We can start, start to create a pipeline that runs our tests and then runs our ETL process using all the same logic and the same functions that are defined in the central kind of functions notebook. I'm going to show you what that looks like. So here we've got a pipeline that has two steps. They're both notebook steps. The first one calls into the test notebook. So the tests are run first. And obviously if the tests succeed, it's then going to run the second notebook, which calls into the process sales data kind of main ETL orchestration to actually run the process. Now, what's interesting is obviously if the tests pass, the processing is going to happen, but if the tests fail, the second activity isn't going to run. And I want to show you that as well. So in order to do that, let's go back to our functions and let's change that logic again. Oh, it already has changed. So instead of dropping the uh, duplicates by order ID, we're going to uh, uh, make sure that we um, uh, fail, fail the process because we're only returning distinct orders of which um, the test doesn't account for. So we run this pipeline, our test step is going to fail, which means the processing won't occur, and we should see that test error message in the pipeline error as well, so we can see what's gone wrong. So our pipeline's finished running, and as we expected, it's failed because our unit test has failed. We dig into the error message, our unit test error message is available in here, so we can see why it's failed. Someone's changed our business logic around how our duplicate orders are cancelled, and we can go and dig into that and, uh, and sort it out. But the important thing is our tests have acted as a quality gate in our end-to-end -end pipeline, meaning that we ensure our quality of the results that are going to get published um, to the business ultimately. So that's the end of this session. Uh, I know it's been fairly fast paced. Um, hopefully uh, it's made sense and hopefully I've proved it's actually easier than you think to structure your notebooks for testing. 
Um, the benefit of notebooks is this agility and this speed and getting things working very quickly and then turning things into pipelines and running it and, and, and getting value out of that process as quick as possible. But don't forget about good solid engineering practices. It's quite straightforward with a slight shift in mindset with a bit of restructuring that you can actually bake in quality gates and unit testing into those notebook processes to make sure that the results you're providing to the business, the decisions that people are making on can be trusted uh, and therefore useful. Thanks very much for listening.